Thanks, Austin. I uh, hope you have your Bibles out. Ephesians 5, 15 to 20. We're going to dive right in. If you remember um, Ephesians, then this may make sense right away. But if I told you that today the world was going, the, the world was going to end this week, that there was short time, right? There would be, there was a limit on how much space you had. Or maybe not a, a giant asteroid is, is flying through space towards the earth. I think a couple weeks ago, some crazy lunatic said the world was going to end, but don't worry, in a couple weeks, somebody else will tell us the world is going to end in a couple days by an asteroid or something like that. But if you hear that message, you hear uh, Y2K version 2 or 7 or however many people times there's going to be a prediction like this is coming, there are really a couple kinds of responses that could happen. For many people, there is the the response, well, I'm not going to work tomorrow. If I've got one day, I am going to take vacation and I am going to get a credit card and I'm going to spend all that money on that credit card because ain't nobody going to make me pay it back. And I'm going to party. If the world's going to end, I'm going to have a good time until it ends. A blast while you last, right? Or... There may be other people who perhaps they figure themselves more noble. They look and say, well, I'm gonna, I'm, I, got, I got some things to accomplish before this finishes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get after it. I'm going to get up earlier tomorrow for work. I'm going to do these things, right? That's kind of a goofy example, but I think that actually the book of Ephesians doesn't give us an asteroid in the sky. It doesn't predict the end of the world as in tomorrow or next week. But the book is written in the perspective that the world is ending and that there is time that is shortening. There's not an unlimited amount of time. In fact, there is a destination on which this train is headed. Do you remember what that destination is? In verse 1, 9, and 10, it said that God was uniting all things in heaven and in earth under Jesus Christ. That that the, the train stop, which was last, was or is Jesus Christ ruling over everything? God's unfolding a plan towards a specific place. And currently, the world as we know it is embracing path number one. Well, if I've got this life, I might as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I might as well have a blast while I last. I might as well spend on myself and get mine You don't see a U-Haul behind a hearse, I might as well just enjoy it, right? I'm not taking it with me when I go, it's just the one who dies with the most toys wins. But the perspective that Paul gives the Ephesians is one that's a little bit bigger. It's one that says, no, this isn't all that's here and now. Christ is actually not just bringing the world to an end, He is actually bringing things into right relationship with God for a future. That we are becoming, if we have turned from sin and trusted in Jesus Christ, what we will be for the future, a people rightly related to God and rightly related to each other. And and this is why he says, don't live the old way, live in the new way, the way you learned in Jesus which is key to remember from the fact of what, of what our first verses say. Look at verse 15. It says, be very careful then how you live. Think about how you live. I have a big point up here that I want you to hang your hat on today that is, is, is going to take some unfolding because it could be misinterpreted if you don't plant it in this passage. It says, Christ's new people must make the most of life by singing and serving, okay? If I told you to make the most of life and you walked out now, you could easily miss completely what I'm about to say about making the most of life. You could think I meant eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. You could think I meant, hey, have as much fun while you can until you can't. But I think that the Bible in this passage actually presents a different make the most of life. The reason I've used that phrase, though, is look at verse 16. It says, making the most of every opportunity in the NIV. 
that right in this passage is a perspective, not of a giant asteroid, but of the fact that the world is, is headed in a direction to a stop. And that stop is eventually everything will be united under Jesus, under God. And so believers, while they look forward to that, need to live a certain way. And there's two portions. Look at the verses. Verse 15 through 17, call Christians to live wisely, to take advantage of the time they have, to think carefully about what God wants them to do. And verses 18 through 21, explain part of what living wisely and making the most of life looks like, namely gathering for worship and serving. Okay, that's, what I'm, that's how I'm organizing how we understand this passage. So let's dive right into the first half. If we're going to, Christ knew people need to make the most of life by singing and serving, it needs to be planted in the passage. So look at the first phrase. Be very careful then how you live. The first point, probably the first half, 15 to 17, you could just think of Paul saying, be wise. It's another way of saying make the most of life. Because wisdom is a, a word that really means something equated to skill in applying Skill at life. We'll get there in a minute. But first, he says, be careful then how you live. And I love the NIV, but I think that there was something they miss out on when they say how you live. Because really, this word again and again in Ephesians comes up as your walk. Right? It's, it's the word for walk. So if you looked at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, As prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. It's walk worthy of the calling you have received. In, it, it, in verse 17, it says, So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. That, that you would live your life or walk in love. Right? He's, this journey of life, you understand the image, you understand why the NIV has translated it as lifestyle or live, is that this journey of life is supposed to reflect what we believe. And so Paul says, make... You, your encounter with Jesus changes the way you live, navigate your life. Your daily lifestyle should be Christian. And don't feed into that all the things you might think of in our culture as Christian. What I mean is your daily lifestyle should reflect that Jesus has saved you. It's not as much about specific types of clothing or specific foods you do or don't eat. It's it's about a posture towards God and others we've been learning in Ephesians, right? God's world has been rebelling against him and, uh, and has been hostile with each other. And we who have been transformed by Jesus Christ now live a life that is in submission to God and serving each other. Jesus has given us a new perspective. This is what the walk, this is what fuels the walk. He's given us a new perspective on, and hope on our old broken world and relationships with God, it, it was ruined. It was not right with God. It was not right with each other. But Jesus came, right? And he lived perfectly the way we couldn't. He had a perfect relationship with God. And then he died on the cross, taking the penalty for all the rebellion and, and hostility that we had accumulated, our sinfulness, right? He made payment so that he could bring us back to God. And in, as Ephesians told us, reconciling us to God... He has created the groundwork for unity amongst ourselves, right? He brought us back to God, and now anyone who's right with God isn't clinging to themselves or their self-interest. They're clinging to Jesus. And so we find a bunch of other people clinging to the same lifeline. In reconciliation to God, he has united for himself a people for him, of his very own, a family under God. And this changes the way we live daily life. It doesn't just change our eternity. Because of Jesus, think about this, we have security, the security of a loving relationship with our Heavenly Father, who is the creator and controller of everything. So you don't need to steal or act violently or deceive to protect yourself. Because the most powerful, important, and knowledgeable person in the universe is for you, and working out plans on your behalf. Because of Jesus, we, don't, we have been forgiven of our sin, wiped clean of our shame and our past, and clothed with his righteousness, right? Clothed with his worthiness. So we don't need to brag. 
Okay? We don't need to distance ourselves from others because we fear they'll see what we're really like. We don't need to try to create a perspective of ourselves that's higher by belittling others. We are accepted in Christ. We have, we have confidence in Jesus because he's given us a, a, a firm expectation on the future. So the full, unending, unhindered joy of God's new creation gives us the self-control to live not for this life, not for the immediate desires we have, not to chase pleasure or make ourselves the center of our universe. It gives us the ability to serve. So the good news of Jesus, it's like, it's like if you ever you, you spill milk, it doesn't, it, it, you might have thought it just spilled one place, but actually it somehow gets everywhere, okay? That is what the good news is supposed to be like. There is no, there, it's not just one portion of your life. Oh, Jesus took your guilt, and now you're no longer guilty, and you're right with God. But yes, that's maybe where you saw the milk spill, but believe me, it's everywhere. Jesus is going to change the way your entire life is lived. And Paul's trying to help them see where the, where the, the milk needs to coat their life. It, it gets everywhere, but it doesn't get everywhere on its own, okay? The gospel. And in fact, the natural state of your life, here's what the natural state of your life is. <clears throat> to keep living the way you've always lived. You're going to do what you've practiced. I've talked about this with you before. You're going to make, you're, you're, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Why? Because they've practiced and practiced and practiced. Well, you can, but old habits, as they say, die hard. And you've worked hard at learning to think like someone who thinks the world is just about them and is only as long as this life. You've had a million little encounters that confirm in your heart that the desires and thought patterns and actions of this world and this life are right. And so, because of all that practice you've put in to live hostile to God and each other, it's going to take diligent effort then to live like Jesus. So that's why Paul would say, look at 15, be careful then how you live. Put attention on your walk. You've got to think about living for the glory of God. You can live literally, you can do everything for the glory of God. But just because you can do everything for the glory of God does not mean that we will do it without thought, on accident. In fact, the trajectory of our hearts for so long had been against God, the nature of sin still indwelling in us means that we actually have to stop and think and put attention to walking for the glory of God, all right? This should be obvious. I mean, it, it's not going to be natural and easy in our day because look what it says in the passage. It says, be careful how you live, not as unwise but wise. Let me come back to that in a minute. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. It's going to take work to live wisely. It's going to take work to live with skill for the Lord. It's going to take work to make the most of every opportunity because the current is flowing a certain direction. The days are evil doesn't mean that sunshine is evil. It means that the current state of play, the ground rules of this world that is ruled by the prince of the power of the air is actually flowing away from God. It means that, that, that the, the, the drift, you're not swimming in a lake. Let me say it that way, right? You're not swimming in a lake where basically just wherever you are is where you'll end up. If you sink, you'll go straight down. In a river, what happens? You get out on your little inner tube and you look up and all of a sudden you're down the river because it's flowing a direction. And Paul says the days are evil. So he calls people to swim upstream, to look and think carefully, to notice that they're floating, not as unwise, but as wise. People who practice wisdom is the word of skill in life. P what wisdom should be rendered as something that, that will unfold in a minute, but, but they, they think and discern and plan and they act on life. They don't get carried along by life, all right? Because the days are actually carrying you along a certain direction, away from God. To, to speak of it in different language, the state, we're, we're behind enemy lines. 
If you just relax behind enemy lines, you'll be overtaken by the enemy. Jesus has formed for himself a new people, but as Ephesians chapter 6 will tell us, there's an ongoing battle in which we're engaged, and you don't go to battle on accident, or you don't survive battle. You don't swim in a river without thought of the current, or in the ocean without thought of the riptide, or you end up at the bottom of the sea, right? And Paul's telling people who've been transformed by Jesus Christ to now be careful, diligent, thoughtful about the way they live, to apply wisdom to their lives, okay? And let me just illustrate this for a second. I mean, we might think of overt immoral dangers. There's, there's a drug dealer on, at, at close hand for almost anybody who wants some weed or whatever, like, like in a heartbeat. You could find them within these blocks. There's a liquor store every other block, everywhere you look, okay? There's plenty of access to prostitution and pornography and immorality at every turn. These things are obvious and overt, and they're still temptations, right? But that's not the only way the world, the current is going. Like when you see rapids, usually you avoid them. And so some of my concern is that most of you would look at the rapids of life and go, wow, look at the jagged rocks sticking out of that liquor store. I'm not going to swim there. Look at the, the death and, and rampant danger of lifestyles in, in the gang life, even, even a couple blocks from here, right? That, that This is dangerous. Maybe I won't swim in that area. But many Christians, I believe, have avoided the danger of alcohol or of drug addiction or of, or of sexual immorality, but they have been overcome by the still waters with a dangerous current underneath them of uh, materialism and of greed. They have lived their life because they've seen a million commercials. They've, they've lived through as many years as they have of Black Fridays, of, of structuring their lives around their own desires, of bringing their life to its culmination for themselves. So I challenge you this. Okay? The dream life you have, okay, whatever your dream existence is, your dream life is definitely bearing some imprint of the world that is hostile to God. What, and, and I'm not trying to say that against you and not me. All of us are underestimating how actively we are shaped by the forces around us. And so what I'd ask you to do is actually start with the assumption that your dream life bears some resemblance to the fallen world who doesn't know God. And then say, how can I root that out with what the Bible presents as the beautiful picture of life? So years of conversations, of friendship, of, educations, of, of education, of TV, of every commercial telling you a story about what is best and desirable, all of it's been forming you. And if you're independent... And enjoy isolation. Maybe you dream of a life alone in the woods, which is completely unbiblical. I dream of that, and I like people. But do you realize that, that the Alone in the Wilderness show is an expression of fallen humanity? Not, not that those people, I just mean the idea. The ideal of isolation is anti-biblical. Maybe you're more communal and you think of being at the center of the party or downtown Manhattan and you more like the real housewives of whatever where they just are in the thick of all of the luxuries of life and the center of the party. That's usually the one that we often a little bit more see as, ooh, that's dangerous. But even, okay, the smaller version of that where so many Christians have considered it appropriate to live in communities that are completely like themselves to pull into their house which the garage door closes behind them and go into their home and wall themselves off from others they have bought into an independence that is unbiblical your dream life is bearing resemblance to the fallen world you've had too much exposure to it so have i so we should think carefully about our desires. We've been shaped too long. So what are we to do? Well, we're supposed to actually step back, be wise, and make the most of every opportunity. How are you going to do that? How are you going to make the most of every opportunity? That's what the passage says. 
Well, first let me read the second phrase. Don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The fool, who is the fool in Proverbs? Okay, I'll read a couple of them. A few of the characteristics of Proverbs fools sound a lot like Ephesians. See if you can hear them. Fools are lazy. Paul said don't steal, right? But work hard with your hands in Proverbs 24, 30. They have uncontrolled tongues. Have we heard that in Ephesians? Rage, bitterness, anger, right? Fools have uncontrolled tongues, Proverbs 18 and Proverbs 29. And, and fools lie. That's what, that's what Proverbs 6, 12 tells us. Fools slander, fools quarrel, fools are quick-tempered, they're proud, they hate knowledge, they despise advice and correction, they are reckless and careless. And the picture that Paul has been describing is someone who is self-controlled, who is hardworking, who is sacrificial, who is conscious of others and submitted to God. Isn't, isn't it interesting? The fool is the person who's going the way that we were always taught to live, right? The natural course of life. Live no longer as the Gentiles do is what I'm trying to help you conclude is that default living is foolish living, Look at the way verse 15 and 17 are structured. It says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. 17 says, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I think those could be paired up. Okay? Unwise and foolish, naturally we see. Wise and understanding the Lord's will. Okay? How are you going to make the most of every opportunity because the days are evil? You're going to be wise or you're going to understand what the Lord's will is. This raises an interesting discussion because for us, the Lord's will is a very mysterious thing when I don't think it needs to be. Why don't you flip to uh, ch chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, okay? Understanding the Lord's will is, is right in these passages, these pages, okay? It says in verse 9 and 10, let's start in verse 8. With all wisdom and understanding, God made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things under, in heaven and on earth under Christ. So you want to know what the Lord's will is? There it is. Big picture? You want to know the Lord's will? I think first and foremost, in Ephesians, Paul would be saying, understand the Lord's will. He's saying the world is headed towards a stop. Right? A stop on the train. And it's headed to the end that is rightly aligned under Jesus. So, understanding the Lord's will as, hey, everything is headed towards being rightly aligned under Jesus. How would I make the most of every opportunity? I would live my life rightly aligned under Jesus and for his purposes. I would live my life for the message that brought me out of darkness into light and for the glory of the one who brought me out of darkness into light. I would live my life no longer self-centered, but the way Paul's been unfolding, for the good of others. What he's, what he's telling us, I think, is this. It's going to take discernment, but you need to look at life and decide, how can I live for the glory of God and for the abundance of good works toward other people? How can I make the most of every opportunity to do good and spread the gospel? Those, those things are what it looks like to understand the will of the Lord and make the most of every opportunity. Often this passage, I think, if you're a Christian, you've been in the background where you're going, I need to figure out the Lord's will on this situation. So you always hear the abuses of it. Like the girlfriend says, I didn't think it's the Lord's will, so she breaks up with a boy. Well, she just, just break up with him. You don't need to tell me the Lord's will on nothing. He didn't write first you know, whatever your name is, a letter from, from an apostle that said this boy is not good for you, or some pastor says the Lord's will is this. Well, maybe you should just say, I think we're going to do this. But if it's not in the scripture, you can be pretty confident that you, you, you need to be, oh, I say you should be less confident about the Lord's will, right? You should say the Lord's will is clearly revealed here. That's why I point to you that the Lord's will is that he is going to bring everything rightly aligned under Jesus in Ephesians. 
The rest of Lord's Will, if we wanted to take an expanded discussion of it, is what's revealed between these two book covers right here. God's Word, right? And so if we rightly understand and apply God's Word, we can be saying, I'm going to take this and I'm going to make the most of every opportunity. I'm going to be wise. I'm going to, as a professor of mine used to say, wisdom was rightly understanding and applying God's Word in daily life. Understanding and applying God's word in daily life. That's how you make the most of every opportunity. It doesn't mean lay out a fleece and, and hope that you make the right choice between two good options. It means lean wholeheartedly into what God has revealed for his glory. That's what you need to be doing. That's what I need to be doing. Here's an example of how he's going to unfold that. I hope that's making sense. We cannot drift... We have to look into God's word and say, God's word reveals to me that he's bringing everything under Jesus Christ. How can I live to speed that up and to make that known and to embrace it in my life? If everything is going to be under Jesus Christ, maybe you could live out the ethic of Jesus' Lord's Prayer. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right? Jesus is saying, I want the obedience that things in heaven and the, the, the angels in heaven give you and the way that your glory is known to be realized here. So I really think that Paul's picture of the Lord's will in Ephesians would be saying, yeah, in Jesus, everything's going to be known just that way. And so you, to look not foolish, not unwise, but wise, to make the most of every opportunity, you're going to think, what gives God the most glory? What makes Jesus Christ known? How can I le leverage my energy and my time and my gifts for that end? Christ's people must make the most of life. That's how you're going to make the most of life. By living for the one who is going to be at center stage for the rest of eternity. So, how are we going to do that? Well, I think this passage starts to point us in one direction for some good advice about how to apply that out. Here's what he says. Don't be foolish, but understand the Lord's will. The Lord's will is that everything be united under Jesus Christ, right? Don't be unwise, but be careful to live worthy of your calling, if I can borrow words from Ephesians 4. Wisdom would say, how can I live under Jesus for his glory and the good of others? Here's one example, a pathway forward. Verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Okay, this first part of the phrase, I think, gives us a negative example of what life wouldn't look like. This is old living. If, if, if the river is flowing away from God and, and living for God is not going to come naturally, then... And, and, and let me say this, living for God will come with hard work, careful thought, and wisdom. Thinking about God's word and applying it to daily life. Then do you want to be dumbing down your senses and loosening up your discernment and barring yourself from seeing the world clearly? No. You are not going to... To be a person who's putting your hands in, this, in, in, this, in the control of this strong drink or of any kind of high. Frankly, I can you apply this anyway. Because think about it. If Paul says the natural way you're going to live is going to be against God. And it's going to take work and effort and careful thought to live for the glory of God. Then you can't be tossing yourself into the hands of, of, of your old man, essentially. Because what do people do? When they're drunk, they, do they have more discernment or less? Less discernment. Do they have more control or less? Less control. Do they have heightened emotions and dumbed down thought processes? Usually, right? The angry person might get even more wildly angry, not self-controlled. The, the person... The natural man is almost put on, on, the volume is turned up, is I think part of the heartbeat on why Paul says, don't get drunk. And he's describing a lifestyle, I think here, where someone is regularly doing this. 
if I, uh, I use the illustration at the beginning, the world's going to end, there's a lot of people who would be deciding, well, that's the way I'm going to end the world. That's the way I'm going to ride it out. I'm going to party. I'm going to get smashed. Right? But the Christian doesn't think, hey, the world is ending. I'm going to throw it up to the wind. They think, I am going to be careful and discerning about, I've got this much time left. How can I use it best? Do you see the difference? Instead of revelry, it's actually redeeming the time, as some of your translations might think, right? Or say. Instead of going, hey, whatever, let's have a blast till we last, it goes, wait, there's only however many seconds left on the game clock. We've got a hustle about doing good. We've got a hustle about spreading the gospel. We've got a hustle about being Christ's people. This world is going to hell in a handbasket. That doesn't mean just toss it there. It means let's do everything we can to save it before it happens. That is why getting drunk on wine, which leads you back to the old way of lifestyle, is so counterintuitive with Christ's people. Not under, out of control or under control of some foreign sub substance, but in control by the Spirit. So before I go on to being filled with the Spirit, let me just say a quick word about alcohol, because it is a prevalent thing in our society and community. Alcohol, and I, I, I would consider these principles to be the same for weed, to be the same for most substances where you're getting high and things like this. The... the the Bible does not present a, a situation where these substances themselves are wicked, okay? Because I think that we even see places where, for instance, alcohol is described in a way for medicinal purposes. I don't think that, that for instance, taking uh, a certain prescription for back pain is against what Paul is describing in the scripture or the trajectory of what the Bible describes. There are chemicals that do things to our body. And I think the Bible provides grounds for understanding that, that they're in appropriate places can be uses for that. I think the scripture does provide us with insight into the fact that believers should not be putting themselves in the, hand of th in the hands of substances that will lend themselves to their old man. Turning to these things to deal with guilt or grief or shame or stress, whether it's weed or alcohol or any other prescription, whether it's coffee, frankly, whether it's what, whatever you want to put on the table, putting ourselves in the hands of these things that are not the Spirit. The Bible goes out of its way to tell us about the danger specifically of alcohol, all right? Because alcohol, as you read Proverbs, goes... It is known for generations, centuries, to create idiots, right? To create people who are foolish, husbands who are abusive, men and women who are loudmouths, bar fights. We, we know this, right? We understand from observation and from the book of Proverbs and from the scripture that, that, that alcohol doesn't lead towards spiritual maturity. And that's the ethic that I think we should understand as Christians, is that if these substances are in our lives, whether it's a prescription medication or specifically from this passage, alcohol or any kind of thing like that, it would not be something that dominates and controls us or that we give ourselves up to or trust in. I personally do not drink. I understand that there are Christians who, who come to different issues on this. I'd love to talk about how you could apply that faithfully in your life. I just think that the ethic underneath it is don't give yourself up to something. Be controlled, give yourself up to someone. Because here's what the passage says. The Spirit. But be filled with the Spirit. Okay? Now this is a word that gets abused because people will talk about in, in some charismatic backgrounds or things like that, uh, the, the filling of the Spirit as something that doesn't happen to other Christian, to certain Christians. But the Bible tells us that, that the Spirit is given to all who partake in Christ Jesus. In fact, the, the Spirit is the one, in chapter 1, verse 13, it says this, When you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. It doesn't say anything about when you got a second level of Christianity, or you did enough, or you experienced some spiritual gift. It says when you believed in Him, you were marked with the Holy Spirit. 
What the idea of filling by the Holy Spirit is this. If I could make it visible this way. Control. You live in greater degree of, of, of um, control or influence that the Holy Spirit exerts more direction in your life than he did before. In Acts, in Acts, we know they were filled with the Spirit. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. What happens? The Holy Spirit comes down. They speak with tongues of fire. Right? We, we know it was the Spirit of God. right? And then in Acts chapter 4, they face persecution and they have a prayer meeting. And it says they went out of there filled with the Spirit. It's not talking about some initial filling or some second level sign gift. They'd already experienced tongues, right? So, so if someone tells you to be filled with the Spirit, you have to speak in tongues. What was happening the second time after they had already had this happen? They were filled with the Spirit because it's describing a believer who's walking in step with the influence of the Spirit of God in their life. Paul uses language like this, walk in step with the Spirit. Or I would encourage you to think of this very closely to the words pray without ceasing. The Spirit of God makes the daily course of life an interactive experience in following Jesus Christ. How do we do this? By discerning what the Lord's will is. Here's what I mean by that. If I'm sitting with you, there's often, I've sat with many of you, and I'm trying to carry this out. So this is just, take it for what it's worth, is my attempt to be filled with the Spirit. I'm sitting with some of you, and I know that Jesus Christ would give you... uh, he would give you what you deserve as a, he would love you more than he loved himself. So he would pay attention to your burdens and desires as if they were his own. He would work for your best interest as if you were his own flesh and blood. He would love you and care for you in those things. I've read that in the word. I've experienced that statement of God's word about what the Lord's will is. And then in real life, sometimes I'm tired or busy or whatever. And I'm talking with the Holy Spirit saying, please help me to live like Jesus lived. Please help me to actually not be experiencing a second blessing where I have the control of the Spirit all of a sudden, but to be filled with the Spirit by walking in line with with what He's revealed to me is His desire. Gentleness when someone sins against me. Patience when someone is wearing on me. Humility when someone treats me wrong. And so I am filled with the Spirit. And here's, the, here's what I think the passage describes, all right? Instead of giving ourselves up to alcohol, which leads to debauchery, the old way of life, we give ourselves to the Spirit. And here is, I think, it's, I think you could read the passage saying this. Speak, uh, be filled with the Spirit by, at the beginning of verse 19, by speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. By singing and making music from your heart to the Lord by always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Here's where I mean, because I think these passages, this part is actually more clear for us. Corporate worship is a path for you to live in step with God's Spirit. You're gathering together and speaking the truth in love and the singing you've displayed this morning is a pathway for you to live in line with God's spirit, to experience and, and, and carry out his desire, his filling. That you, instead of giving yourselves up to these other things, should be giving yourselves to the desires of the spirit to build the body. By speaking the truth, by singing from the heart to the Lord and to each other. Look at how it says, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs in the Spirit. Singing and making music to your heart, in your heart to the Lord. That, That you can walk filled with the Spirit today after this message by doing this. Leaning in to the songs we sing. You realize that? Because you can, you can understand the Lord's will. What's he said in Ephesians? To build the body. Right? To build the body for his glory, you can understand the Lord's will, what he's revealed, everything rightly aligned under Jesus. This people is supposed to carry that out, and you can embrace that revealed will of the Lord and walk in step with the Spirit by saying, I'm going to let my hand 
attack that with all my might by singing from my toes so that other people are encouraged in the Lord and encouraged to continue to follow him, see his greatness and glory. And so the Lord knows that I believe it, right? It says you're singing to each other and singing to the Lord. You can be filled with the Spirit in the next couple songs. Right? You, you can carry out what the Lord's will is. You can navigate your life, not foolishly, but intentionally, making the most of every opportunity by getting to church on Sunday and singing from the heart. Isn't that an, and it's an amazing opportunity? Like, and, and this is the thing that I think sometimes we, we undervalue corporate worship in our society because we don't think about it this clearly. We think about it as an option that really it's hard to be a faithful Christian because sometimes we get discouraged. But this is actually a command for us to be people who regularly gather together and who embrace what the Lord's will is to build each other up. And one of the ways is singing together. There's plenty of passages of Scripture to say this, but this is a great passage for you to just to mark in your brain that God wants you to be here on Sunday. Not because I'm trying to keep attendance of anything, but because you have a responsibility, a limited time, okay? There's only so many Sundays in your life. Seriously, you only have a few Sundays. I, I calculated when, when Charlie was born, he's a little bit morbid, but... 18 years of Sundays is something like 900 and it's 918 or something like that. I got 918 Sundays to leave an imprint on her about what matters most to me. Right? So, so, so my father always told me this. He said, you know, I'll miss work before we're going to drive home on a Sunday. We're not going to take vacation on a Sunday unless, unless we're taking vacation the whole week too. It's not an extra day for us. This is my, this is our priority. Our family's built here. And that's not where you all have to land on the application, but the heart he was trying to say was this. The days are evil. The, the world is going to actively shape you and your children every week against current, right? So, so you know a way to make sure that you make the most of everything is to lean into the time you get to sing with God's people and hear the truth of God's word and to communicate to each other. And let me just take a step forward, always giving th to give thanks to God for everything in Jesus Christ and to embrace the relationships that are here. It says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I'm going to get into this one more next week too as we start to read the, the, his instructions for the household. But I'll say this. That we, we probably dig this on Sunday, but can I give you an encouragement? He's not talking about just a time slot. The church is much, much more than a service, though never less. The church is much, much more than a service, though never less. So get here, gather for worship. But do you realize that a, a family meal that your gospel community shares, time together, this is the same opportunity? The world is actively going to take you down current on purpose. It wants to take you away from God. Even more so, your heart is naturally inclined towards all the practice you've given. The Holy Spirit is trying to help you see the plan for God's world. And more than, I'd love to talk about your will, or God's will for your life and, and making specific career plans for you and everything. But more than anything, we can just take from Ephesians the fact that He's bringing everything under Jesus Christ, and he's restoring his world that way. And, and it's very clear that you're in line with God's word and aligned with the Lord's will if you embrace the proclamation of his gospel, the building of his people, and the doing good to others. So that could happen Sunday morning, but it should be, you should be thinking, you know what? A, another chance to gather with God's people, to open God's word, I know how the week is. I know it's busy. I know there are times and things going on and there's other things that you feel are priorities. But think about how many of them will wash away in eternity. There's very few of them that will actually emerge from the fires of the final judgment, right? Very few of the things that we let rival God's people will endure. But the people that you're committed to in this room will be eternally somewhere, right? The people that we fellowship with and try to communicate the glory of God and the thankfulness for his gospel and the truths that are in the scriptures, they will spend eternity somewhere and, and most likely by God's grace because of his enduring power, 
most of the people in this room I'm praying every day will endure eternally in the joy of worshiping God. But there's very few other places, if you're going to discern what's most important and make the most of your opportunities, that you could say, this is for sure going to last. Embrace this opportunity to serve God's people, to worship with them together, to bring glory to God by accomplishing his will, to be filled with the Spirit by speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, or songs from the Spirit, to embrace being filled with the Spirit by singing and making music in your heart to the Lord, by giving thanks, and by submitting to each other. It's a lot on the plate here, but what my burden is this. Christ's new people must make the most of life by singing and serving. What you do is you say, I've got a short amount of time, even if 70 years, that's short, okay, in eternity. I've got a short amount of time. I know where God has said the world is headed. So whatever my gifts and abilities are, I'm going to find a way to leverage my energy for what God has said it, where, the, where the world is headed. I'm going to leverage my abilities for the glory of Jesus' name and the good of his people. For the spread of the gospel, for the abounding of good works, and I'm going to start by singing. I'm going to start by building up these people. I'm going to start by serving them. I'm going to start by giving my life to them. Christ's new people must make the most of life. Not, not party and self-centered revelry, but redeem the time by singing of the glory of God. By building each other up. By committing to see each other grow in maturity. That's what he's talking about. Let's pray. Father, I, I, uh, I hope this has come across clearly. I trust your spirit to apply it. I pray that as we turn to the table, you would give, uh, give us a heart of joy in you. That we would be people 